This is 2LO, the London station of the British Broadcasting Company calling. 2LO calling. The BBC is a hundred years old. Older than television. Older than any extant radio station. Older than itself, if you consider that they're counting from the birth of the original company, rather than the corporation that officially replaced it after five years, and which we still know today. And like most things created for people before profit, it's faced existential threats pretty much from day one. They were first accused of bias when they were still a private company. One way or another, they've pissed off pretty much every Prime Minister they've ever had at least once. With the possible exception of Liz Trust because she wasn't there long enough. Many have tried to destroy them. Some very nearly succeeded. They were almost annexed by Winston Churchill before he was even Prime Minister. The latest attempt might yet succeed. As they reach a hundred not out, their position is arguably weaker than it's ever been. This is Nadine Dorries. She really wants to be the woman who kills both Channel 4 and the BBC. She was Culture Secretary under Boris Johnson's previous administration. Maybe she will be again under his next. Who can tell? Who can tell who's in the Cabinet on a daily basis at the moment? Anyway, under her tenure, she passed legislation to privatise Channel 4, more on which in that channel's 40th anniversary video, and stated outright that the television licence was over. By that, she meant that the BBC, as a public broadcaster, was over. But she needn't have meant that at all. In fact, I'm about to argue for the abolition of the television licence myself. Let me explain, in ridiculously circuitous fashion. For the same price as a day's BBC, you can buy one millionth of a Ferrari. The BBC, the best value television and radio there is. In the past, I've compared the BBC in importance to the NHS. I stand by that, with the clarifying caveat that the NHS wins. Of course it does. But then it's not a competition, and that's not how I intended it to come across. It's more that the BBC is important in the same way as the NHS. And water, electricity, communication, the BBC, and the NHS for that matter, are, as far as I'm concerned, public utilities. The public utilities are defined as everything essential for the public good. When Nye Bevan invented the NHS, he added healthcare to the list, which it should have been anyway. It's just as essential as tap water and heating, and just as much of a right. As far as I'm concerned, it's society's duty to provide it for its people, or at least make sure all of its people have it, when they need it, no exceptions. I admit I'm on less firm ground when I say I believe the same thing to be true about broadcasting, as embodied by the BBC. Socialised power, water or medicine are fair enough. Healthcare in particular being free at the point of delivery is something we in Britain take for granted and would be horrified if we lost. But the BBC provides the same deal, or very nearly, with education, entertainment, art, information and more. But defending the BBC as socialised broadcasting, in the same sense as the NHS, just gets you laughed out the room. But I believe in it. I do. Utilities are public services, and public services are utilities. The benefits of a public service broadcaster obviously aren't tangible in the same way as tap water and ambulances. And no, they're not as important. Without water and medicine, people die. No one will die without public service broadcasting. Human life is not directly threatened. But an organisation like the BBC is invaluable, I would even say essential, for our spiritual health. 
for want of a better term. It represents free at the point of delivery access to entertainment, drama, comedy, documentary, music, and yes, art, if that's what you want. His enemies like to reduce it to Doctor Who and EastEnders. And that infuriates me, because it's hard to imagine a more disingenuous argument for anything. The BBC, as its enemies well know, is vast, and it generates and nurtures a vast amount of British culture. Ten national television channels, for now. Ten national radio stations, 40 local ones, the World Service, 13 international television channels, broadcasting services in more than 40 languages, in places where it's the only independent media anyone can find. Children's BBC, which remains pretty much the sole remaining dedicated service still creating and developing children's broadcasting in the country. Children in need. Peerless events coverage, the envy of the world. Half the British cinema industry. Stewardship of one of the largest broadcasting archives in the world. The damn proms. Socialised culture. Why the hell not? At its best it's delicious and nutritious for the whole public consciousness and it can do all this and more because it's a publicly funded public service broadcaster. Sure ITV and Channel 4, both of whom also have public service remits, can and do do some of those things. I'm not putting them down. But even put together they couldn't do it all. Especially with the need to sell advertising space, tying a hand behind their back. They were telling the truth in those mid-90s promos. It's ours, and it needs to be ours. Because who else is there? All privatising the BBC would do is to take something that is by definition intended to serve the people and put it in the hands of the usual plutocrats and oligarchs that serve no one but themselves and who already own the majority of the rest of the media. Elon Musk, the world's richest ugly man, recently threatened to press a button and throw Ukraine to the wolves just because someone told him to fuck off. He changed his mind in the end, but he still has that power to essentially destroy an entire country on his whim. He's also about to solely own Twitter, a global communications platform so vast that it's practically another public utility in itself. With that kind of power in the hands of unaccountable robber barons, public funded public service broadcasting is more vital now than ever. I've said it before, but the alternative to the BBC isn't no media, it's no non-corporate media. Rupert Murdoch is still alive, and so's his empire. Comcast, who now runs Sky, and Viacom, who own Channel 5, are only better in that they're not run by one of the most evil beings alive. ITV has its own public service remit, but the PLC that runs it could be taken over by anyone at any time. And then there's Dory's other big idea, selling Channel 4 to the highest bidder, which could easily include Murdoch, or Amazon, or Elon Musk. Or anyone, really. This is what we need the BBC to protect us from, or at least act as an alternative to. A broadcaster for the people, accountable to no one but the people. Now, part of the problem with all this is that it implies some kind of praise of the BBC as it is right now, as if I'm saying it's already perfect and should be preserved in amber the way it is. That's more or less the opposite of what I mean, though. When I describe the BBC as an essential public utility which must be preserved at all costs, it is in itself a criticism of the modern-day corporation as much as anything else. What I'm praising here, what I've always been praising, is the ideal, not the reality. Because in reality, it's not living up to itself. I described it as something intended to serve the people. I didn't say that was what it currently is. We all know by now that its news department is basically run by once and future conservatives for that party's benefit. Not that it helps when the party's a massive imploding fatberg. But that's also true of the backroom staff and the people running the corporation. And it's not an accident 
Over a decade ago, when this seemingly endless Tory misgovernment was young, Chris Patton was appointed chairman of a BBC that had already been gleefully horsewhipped by the previous Labour government. Patton's appointment was the start of an infiltration of the corporation's governance by people ideologically opposed to its very existence. Hardline Tories who would slowly mutate it from within into conservative propaganda while preparing the way for its eventual privatisation. I don't want to imply any kind of conspiracy, if only because I think that credits certain people with a lot more competence and foresight than they deserve. It could just be a case of the wrong people showing up at the wrong time. Either way, it ended up with a chairman who worked as advisor to both Boris Johnson, when he was Mayor of London, and Rishi Sunak, and a Director General who used to be a straight-up Tory politician, neither of whom leapt to the corporation's defence when Nadine Dorries announced that the licence fee was dead. Which brings me back to that thing. The old licence fee. Dory said it will never be renewed again, although with the government throwing up in its own mouth, her policies are kind of in limbo at the moment. I can't see them not sticking with it, however. The licence is definitely on death row, one way or another. Obviously, the Tories just want to scrap it all together out of pure spite and horror at anything being publicly funded besides themselves and their rich friends and the military. Me? I want it reformed because it's obviously an anachronism, with an unnecessarily punitive aesthetic. The idea of having to have a licence, a paid permission, to watch television and listen to the radio made some sense when broadcasting was young and the wireless was the centre of the household and television a luxury. The system has survived a century since then without really changing. But by now, it is terribly out of date as a way of framing the public funding of the BBC. Television, as a noun for a specific object, is practically obsolete, and yet the BBC's funding mechanism still frames itself as a permit to own a box with a screen in it that provides much more than just the BBC content and has for decades, and which technically you don't even need anymore. Now let's be real. It's a tax. Of course it's a tax. That's how society pays for itself. Roads, streetlights, the welfare state, the NHS, public education, policing, all funded by the people. Or at least the ones who aren't rich enough to weasel out of it although those people do still benefit, the BBC's tax is separate and distinct, which, rightly or wrongly, gives it an extra status and forces extra scrutiny. It's also, and this is the real kicker, flat. A single nationwide fee. It's a poll tax. All right, it's a goddamn poll tax. Fortunately, it's very, very small, a mere £3.06p a week. Although once this government's done with the pound, that could mean anything. And millions of people nationwide quite willingly pay vast amounts more to the likes of Sky, Netflix, Disney, or all three and more, for far, far less than they get from the BBC. But that doesn't change the bare fact that the television licence is an unfair tax based on terminology and assumptions that have been obsolete for decades, at least. It's a bad look. It makes the BBC look totalitarian. It no longer makes sense. But the BBC has to be publicly funded, or it's not the BBC anymore. Has to be. I already covered it. We need non-corporate media. We need socialised culture. We need public broadcasting. Dorries and her fellow Tories, rhyme not intended, have repeatedly suggested switching to a subscription model. HBO or Netflix-like. That wouldn't work. For something as vast as the BBC, the fee would have to be absolutely astronomical. Particularly as they wouldn't get a fraction of the subscribers they get now by which I mean practically the entire population of the country. A Netflix model BBC would be bankrupt within 18 months at best, probably less than a year, unless, and this is the conclusion the Tories are trying to encourage, it scales itself right down 
to more or less Netflix size, sells off most of its assets, starts running adverts on their radio stations, closes five or six of its television stations, sells the proms, stops making anything remotely difficult to run commercial, and even then they'd still struggle in the vast ocean of cottage industries that is streaming entertainment. So no, if we want to keep the BBC as it is, let alone improve it to how it should be, the Netflix model is untenable. So what's to be done? Well, I've already argued that the BBC is essentially a public utility as it is. And until monetarism came along and ruined everything, those were funded by the public from general taxation. This would immediately be fairer, as fair as the tax system itself anyway. It won't be a poll tax anymore, that's the important thing. It would also be evasion proof, Gary Barlow notwithstanding. As its licence fee evasion costs the BBC £180 million a year, that's a tremendous saving right there. And a lot of that comes from honest mistakes, such as people moving house and momentarily forgetting the TV licence. Such mistakes would be impossible with a directly tax-funded BBC. The corporation could continue to rely on a steady income, steadier than ever, that came directly from the people it exists solely to serve. Of course, there are downsides. If the BBC's funding comes directly from the Treasury, it will fundamentally change its relationship with the government. Any government. Specifically, it could become the government's bitch. People sometimes call the BBC a state broadcaster. It's not. A state broadcaster is literally owned and controlled by the government. The BBC is a public broadcaster. It owns and operates itself. It is functionally independent from the government. If depended on it for survival, thanks to the 10-year charter system, a BBC funded by general taxation, however, would run that risk of being controlled directly or indirectly by the government, more so than it is now. Susceptible to interference or outright blackmail. It happened in Australia in the early 70s. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam complained that the news on ABC, the income tax funded public broadcaster, was biased against him. And so he slashed their budget by the precise amount they were spending on news and current affairs. And he wasn't even a Tory. It's a chilling scenario, and one that's apparently often brought up in dark mutterings in the BBC corridors. But it isn't an inevitable consequence. A funding through general taxation model could be a threat to the BBC's independence. If we know it can happen, we can prevent it. The corporation's independence will simply need to be guarded and protected like the Holy Grail itself. Booby traps, ancient crusader guardian, decoy independences that aid you into a skeleton the works. Specifically, the government must be prevented from interfering editorially or from turning off the money supply, or even just threatening to do so. Say so by creating a middleman who work closely with the Director General and the Chancellor of the Exchequer on an annual budget, which once decided and ratified is immutable. A BBC trust, if you will. An executive committee to replace the Board of Governors. There must be something in this. Another concern that's been raised is that this would remove the direct link between the BBC and the consumer, in that they're no longer paying for it. I'm not quite so sure about that. Apart from the fact that this link has fostered seething resentment just as much as gratitude, probably more so in fact, it is actually still there, the customer will still be paying for it, at the same time that they're paying for the NHS and schools and roads and things. The trick is to convince the public of my argument that it actually belongs categorised alongside them. Which I admit might turn out to be impossible. Failing that, Reforge the link with the publicity campaign, with community action. Be visible. That's why I have no patience for the argument, why should I be forced to pay for it, I don't use it. For a start, yes you bloody well do. 
Short of going full Walden, I don't believe it possible to live in Britain for more than a week and not benefit in some way from something the BBC is doing or has done, visibly or invisibly. Second, even if you are somehow able to completely avoid its direct influence, it still benefits Britain as a whole. And here you are living in Britain as a whole. It's called a social contract. You pay your damn taxes and that goes in the treasury and the treasury pays for everything. Everyone's paying indirectly for something they don't want, use or need. I can't drive and yet I pay for the motorways. I shrink in utter horror at the mere thought of nuclear weapons. And yet I've paid for Trident's upkeep. I've paid the wages of Ian Duncan Smith, Michael Gove and even Boris Johnson. And all I want from those people is for them to be shut in an iron ball full of angry wasps and fired at the sun! Social contract. As long as money exists, this is how society works. Everyone contributes and everyone benefits. If it doesn't work that way often enough, and no it doesn't, that's not a reason to start acting like it isn't the way it should work. I want the BBC to be the best it can be. A public service broadcaster truly for the people. Funded by the people. Even owned by the people. And answerable solely to the people. I don't know how we achieve that. I just know it can't be impossible. Not if a dumbass like me can conceive of it. One thing's for sure, and I've said it already. The license fee is on death row. It's all but impossible to imagine a scenario where it survives the next few years intact. Alternatives are being looked into in the House of Lords. And pleasingly, their committee already ruled out a pure subscription model and advertising in general on the basis that as I said, they wouldn't make anywhere near enough. They are, however, considering a council tax levy as a possibility. Right now, that would require asking a Tory government to invent a new tax, which is like asking the Pope for a condom, but they're still considering it. So much was taken from us over the past 40 to 50 years. They took our water, they took our electricity, they took our trains, and none of it is better for it, although some people are better off. They even took a great chunk out of the NHS already. We can't allow the BBC to be the final cut. It's no accident that the slogan they've used is 100 years of our BBC. Not the BBC. Our BBC. Because it is ours. Just like our NHS. Just like our water and energy used to be. We make it what it is. Which means we'll only have ourselves to blame.